All right, well, I guess we could get started. Um, uh, welcome to the Hamilton Wood Type and Printing Museum and the sixth in our oral history series. Um, this is the, the final one and this is the biggest crowd because we saved the best for last. Um, <laughs> but uh, just so that everyone understand, we uh, have been very fortunate in that um, we received the money to uh, create these oral histories uh, through a grant written by uh, our assistant director, Stephanie Carpenter, uh, but this was through the Wisconsin Arts Board with help from the state of Wisconsin and the National Endowment for the Arts. So that, that's my legal obligation for the day. Um, but this is, this is a, a wonderful audience. We have not needed to start late uh, because we had to bring out more and more chairs. So uh, I appreciate everybody coming out on such a great day. And uh, we are lucky enough to have Bill Ahern with us. And so uh, we'll get started and, and we'll just begin with some pretty simple questions. I know I had given him an idea of what we were going to ask, but um, you know, the first one is the, is the easy one. When and when and where were you born? I was born in Two Rivers, June 12, 1918, on Washington Street, between uh, 24th and 25th, a little white house. That was a good house because two other sets of twins were born out of that house. So there was something special about it. <clears throat> well, why don't you give us a little idea of one of those other sets of twins? Well, uh, my niece over there has, has two sisters that were twins, twin girls, Mary okay. and Margie are her. Uh -huh. And Doc Simonis, he, he had twin girls, Elaine and Eileen, and the Grumans had, had uh, twin boys, I can't think of what their names were, and the Beckers had, had Twins, but that was another generation. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, what about you? You're a, you're a twin yourself? Yeah. Okay. I was born a twin the first birth. <laughs> <laughs> Got everything down. Uh, yeah. But yeah. It's, it's on our birth certificates. Born a twin first birth, born a twin the second birth. Okay, so technically you were the older brother. Well, yeah. I don't know by how old, how much. Right, right. What was your brother's name? My brother's name was John, and he passed away at the age of 98. No, he's I'm living longer than anybody else in, on both sides of my family. So wow. all my, I mean, my grandparents and my uncles and all, they all died sooner than that. Mm -hmm. The only reason I'm here yet is because the devil don't want me yet. <laughs> <laughs> The devil wanted me, he would have had me already. <laughs> well, that, that's a nice way of looking at it. Well, yeah, if you, if you see your prayers all the time, the devil will watch you. <laughs> um, that's a good point, yeah. Well, and, uh, and you are Irish uh, to boot, right? Well, Irish and German. Irish and German. Can't you Deutsch break it? Uh, nine. Uh, <laughs> but I'm a little bit German as well. Oh, you and, are. Huh? And Irish, yeah. So, well... Are you the only person in your family that worked at Hamilton? No, my oldest brother worked there. Okay. And my grandfather worked there. My mm. grandfather worked there until he was 72 years old because when he worked there, there was no Social Security in that. So they let these people work there longer. Sure, sure. And they gave him jobs at work, maybe a little lighter work. Mm hmm. What did your dad do? My dad was a salesman for car for his school supplies in Mantwalk. Oh, okay. All right. Well, when you started at Hamilton, was that uh, because jobs were available, or did you well, want to be well, there? Well, uh, my first job out of high school was working for Samantha Holt's Food House. I got a dollar a day, nine hours a day. I asked him for a raise, and he said, we can't afford it. So then I got to work with a, a grocery store that had two stores, so I peddled groceries. We used to deliver to houses. Mm -hmm. Well, but there was no, no vacation pay there. There was no pension coming up or nothing. So but then I went to Hamilton. Mm -hmm. I started in juvenile department. I was, uh, had a job. Juvenile was across from, from the city hall, that three-story building. Oh, yeah. Up on the third floor, we made uh, baby furniture up there. Oh, okay. 
play pens and, and beds and potty chairs. And oh, sure, sure. And I was a dipper. You know what a dipper is? Oh, he had no. a big tank where he had sealer in it. Mm -hmm. So you take the, the sides of the, the cribs and, and, and the play pens, you put them in there, and pick them up and hang them on a the line. That was serious. And then he'd go around the line and somebody would sand them a little bit and he'd come back, go to another dipping tank, which was varnish. Oh, sure, sure. I suppose you don't really want to get slivers on a potty chair. Huh? You don't want to get slivers if you got a potty chair, right? Well, yeah, well, then you had the little boy cart from too, you know. Oh. You okay. had to have them. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you remember the, what year you started at Hamilton? 1940. 1940. Um, 25 cents an hour. Was that a pretty good wage then? Well, that was what you were paying. <laughs> <laughs> it was the only on, wage. On that, on that kind of job. Yeah, yeah. Um, 25 cents an hour in bonus. So you made good money on one job, you get another job you win. So by the end of the day, they'd balance it out. Mm, okay. See, so maybe you made some money, maybe you didn't at the end of the day. Sure, sure. Well, who, who taught you your job? Do you remember? Well, I'll tell you what. <clears throat> You learn on the job, mostly. Mm -hmm. But I, when I want to get into machine repair, I asked Mr. Berdoon, because the man that was doing it out of the machine shop passed away, and I used to help him. And he said, what machine can you run the machine shop? I said, a drill press. That's all. Mm -hmm. Didn't know how to run a, uh, a lathe or a shaper or anything else. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'd go to night school. He said, you go to night school. I was 35 years old. I said, sure, I'll go to night school. Went to night school and learned the basics. Mm -hmm. and the rest you, you learn as you go along. Sure. You, you never quit learning. Yeah. Every so. day you learn. Even if you go to McDonald's with all the gossip down there, you know, in the morning, you oh. always learn something. <laughs> some, some of it you don't want to repeat, but you learn. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> well, now, um, I, if I can move back for a minute. Um, 1940 you started, and then um, you worked there for how long before? Well, I, I worked there until I went in the Army in 42. Okay. Then I, but I went from juvenile, then I went in, into the wood plant where they made blueprint units. Okay. I worked on those. How long were you in the war? Uh, 42 months. Okay, oh, so the good long while. Yeah. Well, I started out in a basic training camp down in Georgia, mm -hmm. Camp Wheeler. There was 19 battalions there. But I went into service under limited service because I don't have enough vision in my right eye. Well, then all of a sudden they needed people, so they took all of us 4F guys and, and found jobs for us. Oh, okay. So they put me in supplies. Well, then, then all of a sudden I got orders to, to go overseas. So that was fine with me. They got over into England. They said, hey, you don't belong here. So they sent me to a Peel hospital, checked me out. They said, well, we'll find some." So then I went to the Allied Supreme Headquarters. Oh. And, and my job over in England was to pick up supplies. So I traveled all over England picking up supplies. It was great. Oh, I saw the boy. country. I bet. Didn't have to worry. <clears throat> then we went over to, shipped over to Paris, which was actually Versailles we went to. And then they broke us up to different departments. And I went with the Office of Military Government. So we took, as the troops took over the towns, our people would go in there and get rid of the Bolsheviks out of there and uh, take over. Mm -hmm. we, I ended up in Berlin. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. So. Great um, experience. Yeah, I, I, I think that'd be an amazing experience. You got used to driving in England with no problem? Oh, well, the, you just watch the road signs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it was. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any road maps. I didn't have any over in, in, uh, in Europe either. Oh, really? I'd go from Paris to, to Berlin in a Jeep it, in, in November without any side curtains on it, colder than Billy Hill. Wow. Good Where, roads. What was left? Well, of we aren't on machine to what we we'll get to that part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I didn't bring my haywire along though. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, explain the haywire. The haywire? Oh, 
every farmer had haywire because he was too far away from town, so he had to put some haywire on it so he could finish his job <laughs> before he could get the parts. <laughs> That's the haywire part. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> well, you're young if you didn't know that one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yep, or never worked on a farm, that's for sure. Well, then uh, when you came back, you went back to Hamilton. Did you have a choice? No, no, there? when I came back, I went sailing on the lakes for two seasons. Oh, okay. I, I didn't want to go nailing, driving nails all day long. Sure. Well, then I met my wife. She was selling tickets at the Rivoli. That's the first time I saw her. I said, hey, hey, better take a look at that gal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I met her. Uh, all right, and and did she talk you into going back to Hamilton, or did you just no, need no, to? No, no, no. She, I talked myself into it because if I want that gal, I had to find a job in town. Oh, uh, good thinking. So I went there and I told them I wanted to get in maintenance. They said they didn't have an opening of maintenance, but they weren't going to have one. So they put me in general stores, and we used to get hardware in boxes about, about that square and about that long. Well, they brought in 20 boxes of, of hardware. So the foreman sat up on the platform higher than this. He said, well, uh, over there, put it along that crack of the floor from the hardware floor. So I put one row and I put the next row on top. The next morning I went, and I, because I had just started with them. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, what do you want me to do today? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Why don't you move them back a couple of parts? <laughs> <laughs> I said to him, no, I said, Duke. I'm going to see Mr. Lindsay. He was in the personnel department that did the hiring. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll call him. I said, I'll stay right here and see what you got to say. Mm -hmm. So he called him and he said that I wasn't happy here. So, okay, that's fine. He came out and all of a sudden, Mr. Badoon came. He was the master mechanic. Mm. That was before nine o'clock in the morning. He said, we got an open for you in the, in the millwrights. He said, you start at one o'clock. <laughs> See, so sometimes you could talk yourself into a job. Yeah, yeah. That time I was lucky. Mm -hmm. um, did you like working as a millwright? Oh, sure it was. But a millwright, you took, you moved machineries, you repaired floors, you put the windows, you tarred roofs. Mm. You, oh, everything. You, you, main, you maintained the building, see? Mm -hmm. Well, the machinery repairs just went. But I'll tell you one thing about machinery. You didn't tear everything apart. The majority of things were just adjustments that had to be made. Okay. Here and there you had one. Well, there's a machine over here that I, I took care of that I, that I, after I left Hamilton, I went down, down on the end of 27th Street. They stripped that nut down there that brought the carriage back and forth. Oh, yeah. And then uh, I, I started at 8 o'clock in the morning, got, borrowed a, a torch from Grumman's next door, got the, all the equipment from Hamilton's, and I rebabbed it then. Okay. Heated it up enough to get all the old stuff out, then hook cooked it up and poured it back in. Oh. <laughs> By six o'clock in the evening it was ready to go. Oh really? I suppose that yeah. they needed that, huh? Was that the sander that, that you had That's fixed? the one that got the three drums. Oh, sure. That, okay. that one more the table. Right, back. right. Oh. Okay. Um, but, you know, before you were at uh, the end of 27th Street there, you put in a lot of years in that plant. Well, I was retired when I, went, when I did that. Oh, really? They got me after I was retired. Oh, okay. Well, the same with, they, I went up to Mutun, Wisconsin, because Hamilton sold a, a sander to a, a, a company up there, a veneer company up there, that's out of Shano. Mm -hmm. and, uh they, they, they bought that center and it was there for a year and they couldn't use it because you could never get it leveled off. And, and uh, can't think. Leon Bodick came and said to me, hey, Bill, he said, you know that center? Yeah, I know that upright center. Mm -hmm. What's wrong? Well, he said, it's over at Matu and they got it for a year. He said, they can't make it. He said, I, I know a guy that can take care of that for you. So we went there as well. We went to Appleton, they gave us breakfast. They went up there, they took us out to dinner. And afterwards, they took us to the company club and bought us some drinks. Oh. I got there, first thing, I crawled underneath the machine. I said to the operator, run it up and down. As soon as he started, I said, stop. He said, what's wrong? He said, there's no key on this side of the company. You're only bringing up this side. Oh. <laughs> That's why you can't level it at all. 
what kind of what kind of maintenance man did they have there? Yeah, <laughs> right. Find that one out. Huh. <clears throat> uh, was uh, Leon your supervisor? No, or oh. I'd never worked for him. Oh, really? He just knew who, he knew me. Oh, okay, okay. Do you remember who was your supervisor most of the time? Well, the first one was it, the juvenile was. Uh, I had his name, I forgot it. That, then, I had, then I went to the wood plant, but the guy I had the longest was uh, was Mr. Z. Hmm. Mr. Z is Mr. Zermelin. Okay. But we call him Mr. Z. Yeah. We cut it short. Uh huh. <laughs> was he a good guy to work for? Too good. Oh. Yeah, if you had it coming, he did give it to you. Oh. He was okay. that, that nice of a guy. All right. And, and everybody has, somebody has to tell you off once in a while too, don't you? Sure. If you don't do it right. Well, and, and they do. But I always did everything right, so they didn't have to tell me. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what would a, a typical day be like when you were working in the factory? Well, in the first place, I'll tell you, every machine had, had, a, had a book and it was in the filing cabinet. You take it out because on the back of the page, there'd be a whole list of what troubleshooting is what it said. Okay. All things that could, could be, be have to be adjusted, or mm -hmm. you didn't have to tear the thing apart. See? Oh, right, right. So that's how you worked. Okay. But some guys never, they couldn't do it. I retired and I went to Hamilton. So at that time, we had to get a slip from the nurse to go to the to the doctor. And two of the guys that had worked with me for a couple of years and. But they're always goofing off. They weren't paying attention, you know. <laughs> they had a, had a self-feed rip saw. They had the end ball, bell off. They were putting spacers behind the end ball to stop the shear here from going, to stop from going back and moving. Sure. I said, you can run it from here to Mattel if you'll never straighten it all. Didn't you look in the book? No. I said, <laughs> what, that, what do you think you're there for? Look up. She said, what's wrong? Said, behind the, 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 count, the plate, or the saw went up against, I reached behind there, there's a little bearing, up with a little square. He said, put your hand there and see if you can move that. He said, yeah, he said, that's, there's your problem. Pull it up tight and lock it. Your problem is all over with. <laughs> he said, well, the operator said, Bill used to come here. He said, I'd go out to smoke, sneak outside for a smoke. When I came back, he was gone. <laughs> I never saw what he did. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll tell you, I worked with some good guys to start with. Yeah? Very good men. You remember the names of any of those guys? Sure. Joe Kuss used to take care of all, all the little motors here. Oh, okay. Yeah, he took care of them. Mm -hmm. He did most of that. And Steve Wiesa. You worked with him, you want to do all the work. You say, hey, Steve, give me a chance here. Get, <laughs> let me get in there once. But I'll tell you what, to work in the wood plant or the steel plant, I'd, I'd take the wood plant any time because it was a clean place to work. Oh, and the okay. press room was all greased dirt. Parts were heavier. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> anybody else that you worked with the longest? Do you remember or the Steve was oh, a, yeah. the man I worked the longest with. Uh, okay, and he retired before I did. Ah, all right. Well, one of the things that we I remember when we were having difficulties with the pantograph. Um, I don't even remember who, but somebody said, well, have you called Bill? He knows yeah, about me. that. And so, uh, that, well, that, that, I didn't know that then, but you know, I was surprised that when you came in, whether it was the router or the way it worked, you seemed familiar with the pantographs. So had you worked on those much? No, just a little motors. Okay. I, I showed them a trick to find out how the bearing sound in there. Mm -hmm. When the bearing started to go, take your screwdriver, and put the bit up against the, there and put the handle by your ear and then you can hear the bearings. Oh, okay. And if they're running nice and smooth, then you know that the bearings are good. If they're making noise, it's time you change them. Mm, okay. <laughs> That's just a little secret you learn, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, if you came in to work in the morning, would they have the different places that you had to go? Oh, oh yeah, they'd have, have worksheets there for you. Okay. So the boss would hand out the worksheets. Mm -hmm. How many were in your department usually? Well, we had as high as six. Mm -hmm. And some days you didn't have much to do, and the boss didn't want everybody sitting around there, so he'd tell you to take your little toolbox and take a walk. 
It looks as if you're going somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just another little trick you learned. Oh, well, everybody huh? had. I was standing out across the street from Hamilton's where tearing down the, the steel plant. One guy said, there goes my hiding spot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know, the, it, the factory changed a lot from oh. when you started oh, to when sure. you ended. Um, uh, now, when, when did you retire from Hamilton? In 83. Okay. At 65, I was 65 in 83, May, May of 83. Okay, so 43 years outside of the war, pretty much. But um, you didn't give me credit for for the time I had before because I didn't come back right away. Oh. I went sailing on lakes two years, so I lost him that mm -hmm. time, which you'd have given me the credit. <clears throat> Would you have kept sailing on the lakes if you had a choice? Well, it was nice. Yeah, I bet. Well, you ate good. Uh -huh. And you had three months vacation, but it was always in the winter. Were you, what kind of a, a boat I were was you on, on a cell phone loader. Oh, okay. With the Rice Coal Company. We hauled food and coal. Mm hmm. Where were your stops? Well, we'd, we'd pull into Mantua with a, with a load of coal, and the next time we, then we'd go up to, to Portland and get a load of stone and come back and drop it off at the cement plant, mm -hmm. and then go down to maybe Sandusky, Ohio, or, or Cleveland and load up with coal again, oh. and then come back up this end. Okay. Drop it, maybe go to Green Bay or, mm -hmm. or Mantua, or Two Rivers. Did you like that work? Oh, yeah, it was nice. The job I had was very good because I, I worked on, down in the hole on loadings. You only worked when you unloaded. Okay. You, they were two, on two sides, and they take the hoppers from two sides, and you would you'd keep on working back and forth so you kept the boat at an even, even keel. Oh, I see. Sure, sure. All right. And if you were careful that you didn't spill anything on the floor, you didn't have nothing to clean up. Oh. <laughs> and if you left two rivers and, and went to... Sandusky, Ohio, with, with nothing on, that was a 65-hour run. So look at how, how, how much time you had to sit on on a deck in the summertime. Oh, yeah, yeah. That doesn't sound too bad. And you had four to, four to eight. I, I worked from uh, two to six every day, mm -hmm. at two to six in the morning. Oh, okay. Then you come get in the galley and they want to know how much, what you want to eat. And there was always a soup kettle there help yourself. You mm -hmm. had to stay out of the galley half hour before ser service and, and, that, and after to give him a chance to clean up, uh -huh. get ready. Not bad, Good. not bad. <clears throat> were there any jobs when you were at Hamilton that you really didn't like to do? Well, yeah, when you got a big press that was all greased up and you had to pull it all apart, that, that was no fun. Mm -hmm. But they furnished your coveralls. Oh. And they had washers and dryers, so we had one a washer and a dryer in the coverhouse. So one guy, every, every Monday he would take all the coveralls and go wash. He'd spend a half a day washing the coveralls and drying them, bring them back for everybody. <laughs> pa paid to, he got paid to do it. Uh, that doesn't sound too bad. Um, well, you know, it, it, the other thing that I think about is the what they did at Hamilton changed a lot over the years. Oh, sure, because they, they started out making juvenile furniture, and they made, they, then he made, uh, in the wood plant, they, they made doctor's examining tables and dental cabinets and, and uh, printer's goods. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden they started to drop some of that stuff, and they ended up just, just making lab furniture. Okay. Wood and steel. Right. Right. Um, but did that mean they were bringing in different machines that you also had? No, not running? exactly. Okay. So you didn't have to learn how to run new equipment as you went along? No, like, I'll just give you an example. <clears throat> On the sanding belt, you, to keep the, keep the sandpaper in, in the middle of that, that pulley, you tapered it. They, they put a, a, rubber, a rubber boot on it, a, about three quarters of an inch thick. Mm -hmm. You'd put it on there. You didn't have to glue it because it took a couple guys to put it on. Oh, okay. Then you put it in a lathe and you taper it. 
Oh, that was a creamer. Because you set it up and there was a grinder and you see a bunch, bunch of it with smoke. So you did it nice and easy. So you can get to the end and bring it back and go back again. Mm. Oh, that's, we call that a creamer job. Oh, nice. <laughs> did you... Um... Did you have your own tools, or did they supply you? With? Well, yeah, your, most, most of your hand tools are your own. Okay. They did give everybody a small set of uh, box wrenches. All right. One year for Christmas, we all got a set of box wrenches. No. <laughs> Little ones. They're nice, six mm -hmm. inch, very handy. Yeah. But you, you had your own micrometers and stuff. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, what, what were you typically carrying around in that tool? Oh, in that toolbox? I'll tell you what. You carried a lot in there. You had a couple different kinds of screwdrivers, and you had some drift pins, and you had uh, a bunch of junk in the bottom of it, uh, uh, nuts and bolts and, and uh, set screws and stuff like that, so you didn't have to run back all the time. Mm -hmm. And you had, I had a, a leather that I bent in half, and I bored all holes in, all, all my Allen wrenches were in that. Okay. So if you took one out, you knew where it belongs back. Sure. Sure. And, and then you didn't have to fish around in the box for them. Right. So they were all together. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, and, um, you know, I'm just thinking the, the machines are all needing oil and grease and stuff oh, they like had, that. Oh, they had a man that did that. Oh, they did? Every Monday. Okay. You go through the wood plant and the steel plant and, and oil, it, oil up and what had to be greased was grease. Mm-hmm. Okay. That uh, was his job. Yeah. So that really wasn't part of the job that you had no. then? No. Okay. Did you ever have to... He was uh, a grease monkey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't want that. <laughs> um, did you ever have to move into other departments because they needed you or, or work was slow? No. Okay. They always had enough work for us. Yeah. Okay. Especially six people for a whole plant, I yeah. suppose. And sometimes you had two guys on the job, you know, not one, because it depends on what you're doing. Sure. If you needed help. Right, right. Heavier machines, I suppose, yeah. too. You know what the hog, what a hog is? <clears throat> you, you tell me, and then I'll know for sure. Well, it, all the cutoffs from saws and stuff, they'd throw down a chute, and they would get ground up. The hog would chew it all up, and they'd blow it, blow it into the boilers. Oh, okay. Yeah. That was a hog. But the knives had to be changed every so often. So then we did that. All right. What were those like? We were blades about that wide, and then and the, about that thick, and he sharpened them, put them in there, had a feed like this, slide them in, lock them tight. He had a gauge so they were all the same, same about sticking out. Mm hmm. Just keep them sharp and, and moving, yeah. huh? Okay. And on the shears for shearing, uh, uh, plywood, we, we had the blades, but, but Edgar sharpened them for us because mm -hmm. they had a setup. They, they did a lot of that, see? Mm -hmm. So it was cheaper for Hamilton to set it over there to be sharpened than for Hamilton to set up. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> were you much aware of the amount of type that they were uh, cutting in the wood plant or only if you needed to when go When I there. first came there, they, they cut the, 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 the logs about 18 inches. Mm -hmm. And then they would, they would take guys there with hatchets to, to knock all the bark off. Okay. And then they would run into the bandsaw to cut it in half. So then you had your half of pies. Then they would cut the, all the, half, the pies. Got it. Okay. And, and then they went in the, in the dry kilts, and then they had to, had to go in. Then they would be in, in uh, what they call a tempering shed until they needed to the stop. Mm -hmm. Then they would come in. Oh, okay. So once you got down to the right, right moisture level, then you'd want to maintain that yeah. till it was ready to use. Okay. See, and they found out that it was better to leave that bark on there than to take it off because you had less checks in there so you, you didn't lose as, as much wood. Mm hmm. Okay. And, um. Oh, go ahead. Then they found that out from, from a guy that was a, like a salesman or something that 
tip them off on that. Hey, don't, don't knock that bark over there. Mm. They, they bark up, they fall off of there by the time it's all dried up. Yeah, I suppose. Well, we still got quite a bit of that wood left, even the stuff that is unsanded, you oh, know. Oh, have? Yeah, about 15 Now, who skids. sends it for you now? Well, we have sent it over to a place called Valley Planing in Appleton, and they're, they're good at it, but, you know, that sander over there is designed for those half pies. Most sanders aren't designed for anything no. uh, such an odd shape. So, uh, but the... Uh, they put them on there and they... They, they take the wrench and tap on them to make sure they're tight to the, to the, to the, to the plate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they just don't lock up as good as they do on that machine. So You take it off that machine, put it in the other one, send it again, the other side, put it on the mic, and in low spots, they'd mark it so that the part was thrown away. Oh, okay, okay. Use a, like a, a crayon or something yeah. like that? Okay. Um, well, when you retired from Hamilton and then you went over to HWT, was that an automatic thing um, where you went from one place to the other or did you retire and then? I, I retired and they come and get me oh, to go okay. to, to different places because mm -hmm. they knew I did it. All right. What was it like working there? Where? HWT. Well, I only worked to fix the machine, that's all. Oh, okay. I didn't work for them. I, I, they, they paid me. Mm -hmm. I, I just told them how much I had coming. Okay. And I, oh, so. I, and I finally got smart, you know, because when, when these people are brought in from out to, to work on a machine, they get good money. Mm -hmm. So why should I work? I, I was charged more than I ever made an hour at Hamilton's. Yeah. <clears throat> that sounds pretty good. Well, you, you get smart, the older you get. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still learning. Yeah, well, that's... Uh... You, you've had a lot of years to get smart, so that's good, too. Well, I had a lot of help, though. Yeah? Yeah? I worked with a lot of good guys that knew what you were doing. Uh-huh. Uh, any of them that you, you remember the best, you know, best teacher that you had? Yeah, there? the best one I had was Steve Wieser. Okay. He worked at the shipyard during the war on the subs, and he worked on the conning towers. That was oh. his job. Okay. He was a good man. Mm -hmm. Very good man. Now, I understand that, that you, uh, you still remember where a lot of the older buildings were in Two Rivers, you know, that, that are no longer there anymore. Somebody showed me a picture over at, at uh, Washington House. Mm -hmm. I looked at it and said that building was never in Two Rivers. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, I looked at it and said, we never had one on the, on the main street that had dormers. Okay. I knew that. Yeah. I lived on 20th Street, where the Lutheran Church is over at 20th and Adams. Sure. But that was my folks' property. Oh, okay. That's where I lived. Well, we were kids. We were on the main street all the time. Mm -hmm. We didn't miss nothing that went on. Yeah. It didn't, uh, I'm trying to think. The, the program that they sent out, they had, they had an article in there about that little house that the ticket office that's up by the high school. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, you know where that came from originally? No. On Washington Street. You, you know where that, that, uh, that all, of, all those stores on Washington Street? Yeah, well, sure. At one time, there was a miniature golf course in that area. Really? Yeah, and that was the ticket office. Okay. That, that was moved up there. So he said, I was going to tell Dan uh, uh, Webster about that. Mm-hmm. Because they thought that was built up there. It wasn't built up there. It was moved up there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot of changes to see in the town over the years. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, when I was a kid, there was horses all over. And when I went to school, if you didn't do your lessons, sister said, you're going to end up sweeping the streets, you know, with a shovel, picking up in a garbage can. <laughs> well, that, that's pretty good incentive. <laughs> Well, there were horses a block away from me. Man had a livery stable. Okay. You, you see when he, he get horses in, with, with uh, uh, rope holsters on them, and mm -hmm. the farmers would come and bid on them, pick out a, pair, a team. Really? You know, all draft horses. Okay. Now, on 17th Street, 
um, say halfway between Jefferson and the bridge, there was a, about a story and a half building that someone told me was once a livery for Hamilton. Do you remember anything like that? That was over on the other street, on, oh. on, on 18th Street. Oh, it was? Yeah, okay. that was on 18th Street. Uh huh. Um, were they using it at all at that time, or was everything oh, they uh, were, trucks? They were, and... There was no horses there. They were using it for a garage then. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. But when I was a kid, Mrs. Hamilton would, would come to a lady a couple of doors across the street, Miss Boozy. She was a seamstress. And uh, she'd come there and she had an electric car. She'd steer it with a, with a stick. Oh, really? Yeah, and she'd give us kids a ride up to Grotty's Corner. Now, you don't know. Grotty's Corner is up on the corner of 22nd and, and, uh, and Jackson, Jefferson Street. There's a stop sign. Yep. That building on to your, uh, to your right on the corner. Mm -hmm. That was a bakery at one store, Grotty's Bakery. Okay. She, she'd give us kids a ride that far, and we had to get back and run back up two blocks. <laughs> and when Miss Boosie got a load, see, Hamilton's would cut off the wood, and they'd throw it in a box, too, because people all were, used burnt wood, so they didn't burn, they didn't chew it all up. Oh. Nice, nice pieces they were throwing that, in that box. And then when a box was folded, whoever had an order got it. And they ah. go and dump it there. Mm -hmm. Well, Miss Boosie got a, a load. All the kids in the neighborhood took care of that. Well, a couple yeah. of kids would go in the basement, open up the window, we throw it in, they'd build a wall. Up, so then we, when you threw it in, it wouldn't be all over the basement floor. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Everything had a system. I, that, <laughs> that sounds like a pretty good one. <laughs> and then you got an apple or maybe some cookies. Mm -hmm. Never saw a nickel. Well, People didn't have the nickels to give you. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> yeah, I suppose that would have been in the 30s or yeah. even the late 20s. So, yeah, hard times. Now, um, you were talking about Mrs. Hamilton. Did you, was that somebody you would have met? Mrs. Hamilton? Oh, yeah, we knew who she was. Okay. Remember what she was like at all? Very nice. Yeah. Very nice person. Mm hmm. What about Mr. Hamilton? He was a good guy. Yeah. You know that, that brick house that's got the wall around? Sure. Well, when, when one of the kids would get married, we'd have to go there and move the dining room table out of one room, get it out there so they had more room. Mm -hmm. Then after the wedding, then we'd have to go back up to the millwrights and put it back in the other room because it was heavy, thick enough of us to carry. Oh. And then if there was a lot of snacks left, boy, we could have some of them. Ah, nice. Oh, yeah. Wow. We always came all day. <laughs> <laughs> I had heard that um, Hamilton was one of those people who went through the plant and, and uh, kind of knew uh, people or at oh, least sure. talked to them. That was the case? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He'd stop. He'd never ask. He'd just look to see what you're doing. Mm -hmm. One time I, I had a camper and, and uh, the shaft for the wheels, it was just rubber, about my thick of my finger all the way around the, on the square shafts, see? well, they all slipped to one side, so it hung down. So I took, took, took it off, brought it into Hamilton, put it in a big vise, got a big pipe wrench, pulling it back in place, and Lord Hamilton came, he looked at me, never asked me who, who, what I was doing or who it belonged to. He never, he never would question you on it, he just see what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and they had degreasing tanks. Okay. You know what they are? Yeah. He had your greasing tanks. He would take his hat, that had grease around the van already, sure. throw it in there, get it all cleaned up, take it all, take the air hose, blow it all out real good, <laughs> put it on his head. <laughs> <laughs> he and everybody else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Wow. Those are great memories. I, I sure appreciate you uh, sitting down with us and telling us everything. I was. There's a couple of things. One is that um, we do have a poster lockup that people can print uh, today if they want to, because we, we needed to commemorate the, the uh, visit of you being at the museum. But um, I thought I would see if anybody in the audience had uh, questions that they could answer. But first, uh, I want to give you a round of applause for just being with us today, because I sure appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you.
It was my pleasure. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, See, because when I get to McDonald's, I don't get a chance to talk. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody else is all talking, so I got to listen. So this was my day. Oh. This was my day I could have, I could have the floor. <laughs> That's Jewel, he knows. And then Bob. I think I know what he thinks, but it doesn't sound like he's agreeing with you. <laughs> well, does anybody have a question that they would like to ask Bill? Uh, that must mean you controlled the floor pretty well. You said everything, everything that there was. So, I, I have just a, I've, I've yes. seen the building all my life in Two Rivers. I've never been in the Hamilton building. So I always wondered, one is um, that big, uh, the horn that would get you out at noon or at 4 o'clock, and, and the workers would all seem to come out. And I was wondering if, if Mr. Hearn went home at noon to eat, Okay. When you work, would, you, would you go home at noon and then come back? Or did Hamilton's have a cafeteria or anything like that? So his, his question had to do with, number one, he was talking about a, a horn that uh, blew both at noon and then at the shift change. I, I remember more of a whistle that was on the building, but um, he was kind of curious if you uh, would go home for lunch or, or did they have any... That, that, that. They, they blew it at 7 in the morning and at, at noon, and then they blew it at 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Okay. And did they have anything like a cafeteria in the factory? No, or? they just had canteens around. Okay. All right. buy a candy bar sure. and, and milk. Now, you lived pretty close. Were you able to just walk home at noon if you wanted to? Well, everybody wanted home for dinner. Okay. You had a whole hour. <laughs> oh, all right. Right when I was in high school. Kids lived way over on the south side here, and they'd run from Washington High School, home for dinner, and run back. Oh, okay. All right. Well, why not, huh? Yeah. Better food than a cafeteria, usually. They didn't have a cafeteria. For, yeah. They had one in the office for the office crew. That, and that didn't work out that well, so they discontinued it. Oh, okay. So the people higher up had, had food there. Yeah, if oh. they want to. Okay. All right. Thanks. My dad used to take his bike back and forth to work every day. Um, well, and, and my grandpa, who lived two houses away, would come over. I would still remember them, and he'd say, all to work. My dad would go out after eating lunch. Do you remember when Grandpa Ruel used to come over, they'd take their bikes back and forth to work? She's talking about um, uh, riding a uh, bicycle back and forth to work, and then your grandfather? Oh, my, my father loved it. Yeah, OK. Sure. He'd come and pull in the driver and say, Bill, it's time for work. <laughs> you know? Come on the bike. Keep the daughter happy. <laughs> and then when the weather was bad, then my wife would come and pick us up and take us back to park. Oh, all right. But we lived on 24th Street on the east side, see. Oh, so that wasn't sure. that park. Right, right. Uh, not a bad well, walk. We had guys that came in from out of, on the outskirts. Uh, crap. Came on his bike all the time mm -hmm. out, outside the city. Okay. Well, you take what you can, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you have memories of the Hamilton Band? Uh, she's wondering if you remember the Hamilton Band at all. Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hamilton used to furnish these uniforms every, every so many years. They got new uniforms. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Okay. He would break from Hamilton's office to the bandstand. In, oh. in the park. Right, right. And they play. Okay. Well, Don Connop could tell you about that stuff. Yeah, he, he had told us a little about that. He, <laughs> he, he never quit. He's still in a number of days. That's right. Yeah. Well, practice makes perfect, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, Don oh, said no. that, that the second lady there could tell you like, her husband was, a, was good, good at cabinet work and that kind of stuff. Oh. And I used to go up there and I'd help them. Oh. We'd, we'd go up, up and I'd come and take them. And I'd volunteer mm -hmm. because I liked it. Yeah. And, and he had such a nice shop. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very nice shop to work in. I really want to acknowledge Bill. For, and I want to thank you, Bill, for all that you did for me when I was at Hamilton's. Anytime that I needed a repair person, I always asked for Bill. Okay. And Bill would come and fix the sanding machines and the piece and the 
time saver and Bill is the guy that oh, that I really wanted to, to come up there. And we had a good relationship back and forth. He would always say we were kind of interrelated because his brother was married to a cut up. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just thank Bill. He just wanted to thank you because he said you were the uh, the one he always requested because there were so many things you were good at. And uh, um, so, I appreciate it. well, he, apparently you were good at a lot of different things, and uh, to the point where he always asked for you, which he appreciated. And then, and then it sounds like there's a, a, a slight. Uh, Relationship there. You've got a relative married to a kind of yeah. so. Married uh, brother. He got his first first mother. Ah, okay. Good, good. Well, if we have no more questions, I'd just like to thank you guys again. This has been a really great series. Um, wonderful to get voices like Bill's because. Um, you know, we, we need to do that sort of thing. The, the people are more important than the machines. And, and thanks for, for showing up today. What a wonderful crowd. So uh, thank you guys as well. We sure appreciate it. Well, I'm glad you're all here because I was going to tell you, there's nothing going on on the main street in Trevor this afternoon because everybody's here. There's plenty of balls down the street and nobody get hurt. <laughs> Thank you.